And please pray with me. Gracious God, I ask that you bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds that your Son, Jesus Christ, would be glorified among us this day. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I have come that they might have life and have it in abundance. I added this little verse to our reading today in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, because it is by far, well, maybe not by far, but it is certainly one of my most favorite verses and probably most quoted verses in all of the entire Bible. This little half verse in John, chapter 10. Now what's going on in the Gospel of John chapter 10 is that Jesus is in a deep conflict with the religious leaders of his day. Specifically, he is in conflict with the Pharisees, those particular religious leaders. They're having trouble with Jesus. You see, they are hoping for a Messiah, and they're hearing about all these great works that Jesus is doing, even some of the ones that they are witnessing himself, and they hear that people are beginning to talk about Jesus as the Messiah. The problem that the Pharisees have is that Jesus is not their kind of Messiah. You see, the Pharisees... They had this expectation that the Messiah, the Savior, who people were expecting to come into the world and, and bring salvation, they thought that this, this Messiah would look a lot like, well, a super Pharisee. And on the day of the Lord, when the, when the Messiah would come, well, these Pharisees thought that this super Pharisee would come and it would be like Pharisee Appreciation Day. That he would be handing out rewards to all of the righteous Pharisees and then of course destroying all of, the, all of the infidels, all of the sinners. But you see, this is not the way that Jesus was behaving. Instead, Jesus was actually going to those sinners. And he was even touching them and he was even healing them on the Sabbath day, which for them was a no-no. Because it was the day of the Lord and they believed that you shouldn't work on that day. And, and so he was causing all sorts of troubles. And in this passage in John 10, Jesus says, well, he doesn't say, I am the super Pharisee. What he does say is, I am the good shepherd. I am the one who comes to gather to seek and save the lost. I am the one who comes to protect and to heal and to lead. When Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, what he's doing is he's drawing on some very ancient imagery and a very ancient expectation that goes back thousands of years, back to places like the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament, chapter 34. That was a place where God, through the prophet Ezekiel, was lamenting about the, 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 the leadership of Israel of the day. They were corrupt. They were weak. God called them shepherds. And he said, listen, there's going to be a day when I'm just going to get you out of the way and I am going to come. And I am going to show you what it means to be the good shepherd. And so ever since then, people have been waiting. They have been longing. They have been waiting for that shepherd, which is described so beautifully in Psalm 23, to come and to lead the people of Israel. And here in John chapter 10, Jesus is very plainly saying that he is that one. One of his famous I am statements, there are about eight of them in the Gospel of John. We're going to be talking about one next week when he says, I am the vine. But he says in this case, I am the good shepherd. And ever since he said it, it's become a very powerful teaching of the church. But of course, to understand the true power of this teaching, we have to realize that it's a relational connection. So that means if we are going to call Jesus our shepherd, then what does that mean we are? Come on, people. You're having a hard time getting this one out, aren't you? 
The word is there, but you just don't want to say it, do you? What? Sheep. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. You are the, uh, the bold and courageous one. Yes, indeed, we are sheep. Now, if you have ever worked with sheep, if you've ever spent any time observing them, then you know this isn't the most complimentary comparison. I I'm trying to figure out how to artfully say this. So how about this? Sheep are really dumb. <laughs> right? But work with me here, people. The, the question is, okay, maybe that's true. But still, does that mean that this, this, this figure of speech, that's what Jesus calls it, calls it by the way, himself, in John chapter 10, it's, it's a parable. But is there some way that this this analogy, this figure of speech, will help us to understand. So I've been doing a little research, right? And I'm thinking, if you've been hearing vicious rumors about sheep, I think where you probably heard them was from those mean cattle people. Right? And they think sheep are, are really dumb just because sheep don't behave like cows, see? And it's true. If you've ever seen the way cows behaved, or for example, watched City Slickers starring Billy Crystal, then you know that if you want to get a cow to go from point A to point B, you got to go up behind the cow and kind of, yeah, get along, little doggy, or whatever you're supposed to say, little doggy. But a sheep doesn't behave like that. In fact, the best thing a sheep will do if you go up behind it and yell at it is it'll probably just kind of circle around you. You see, sheep, they, they don't like to go anywhere where somebody who they don't trust hasn't already gone. Sheep like to follow. Now that's not too dumb, right? And the thing about sheep is they tend to develop a trusting relationship 